Good morning, everyone. Hello and welcome to this uh, Build Fisher webinar, the latest in our series of privacy webinars. Today we're covering GDPR, data value, insolvency and restructuring. My name is Hazel Grant and I am the head of data privacy based out of our London office. Thank you so much for joining us. I hope you're very much going to enjoy today. I'm joined by two colleagues, Judy Krieg and Hannah Wallet, and in a few moments I'll ask them to introduce themselves. But first of all, I just want to briefly consider our topic. So with COVID-19 causing economic downturns around the world, we wanted to focus on how GDPR and data value is relevant. We're going to address this across four broad topic areas, and they're listed here on this slide. Essentially, what we are saying is GDPR is very relevant here. Whether you are a business that finds itself contracting with an insolvent business, or you're acquisitive and this is an opportunity for you to take on and buy a new insolvent business, or whether you unfortunately have to suffer insolvency or restructuring yourself, GDPR is going to be key for nearly all businesses. We all know that businesses have value in their data whether it's their customers, the patients, or the public that they're holding data on. In addition, there's also risk when you're handling employee data. But it's not all doom and gloom. There are many practical steps you can take right now to prepare yourself in the event that you're involved with an insolvent or a restructured business. For those of you who don't already know us, I just wanted to say a few words about Field Fisher. We're an international law firm with offices across Europe, in Silicon Valley and in China. Our privacy team works across all of those offices. We are a collaborative team providing strategic and actionable privacy solutions. And I know you're going to hear about that today in this webinar. Turning to housekeeping, please do ask us questions using the question function that you see on your screen. We've left some time at the end and we hope to be able to get through a few questions then. If we don't, then we will definitely reply to you after the webinar. We're aiming to finish at 11 a.m. so you can get back to your emails and your IMs and messages at that point. Later today, perhaps um, early next week, we will send you a copy of the slides and indeed a copy of the recording. So please don't feel that you have to scribble everything down as we go along. A couple of other points. Please do subscribe to our blog and keep an eye out for other webinars over the coming weeks and months. If you've missed one of our webinars, you can catch up by vis visiting our YouTube channel and you'll find the details at the end of this slide deck and also we'll include them when we send out the recording. So now let's just quickly meet our other speakers and I'll turn first to Judy to ask her to introduce herself. Judy, over to you. Hi, I'm Judy Krieg. I am also a partner on Hazel's team based in the London office, but I'll be, of course, recognizable from the American accent. Uh, I also have um, experience working in-house, so I'm very, very keenly tuned towards the practical considerations um, that you may need to consider when either your company is dealing with these issues or you're dealing with a company that's going through these issues. Um, my picture is the one in the middle with the beautifully coiffed red hair, and that's how I want you to all to think of me today. Thank you so much, Judy. So now let's turn to Hannah. Hannah, could you introduce yourself to our listeners, please? Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Hannah Wallet. I'm a solicitor in Phil Fisher's privacy, security and information law team. I've been at Phil Fisher for four years and qualified into the team two years ago following my training contract um, where I actually did a year specifically on data protection law. Um, I spent six months in our Silicon Valley office and six months in our London office. I work with a lot of clients headquartered in the EU and the US um, across a wide range of sectors and I look forward to speaking to you today. Thanks so much Hannah. So let's um, move on now to topic one and let's turn to Judy who is going to take us through both topic one and topic two. Judy, over to you, thank you. Thanks Hazel. So insolvency, restructuring and value, where does GDPR fit in? 
um, bearing in mind that GDPR is still relatively new. I know we're, we've just celebrated the second anniversary of it. Um, and so where does it fit in with what is a more familiar landscape of insolvency and restructurings? Uh, well, first let's talk about what we mean by insolvency. And this is not meant to be a, a lesson on insolvency or to get you skilled on insolvency, but basically speaking, um, and def from a definition standpoint, um, there's two different definitions of when a company is insolvent um, under UK law, and it's very similar to other country laws, which is at a very high level when a company is unable to pay its debts. There's two general term tests to determine that, the first one, that first bullet point is called the, uh, the cash flow test. If a company cannot pay its bills when they come due, uh, the second broad test is the balance sheet test, which means on the company's balance sheet, the liabilities exceed the assets. Uh, now, again, it varies from, from country to country, but broadly speaking, when you're in one of those situations, you are technically, the company is technically insolvent. Um, it may or may not involve the insolvency service, and it may or may not, involve an insolvency practitioner or an administrator um, coming in to take decisions over the management of the company when you are in an insolvency situation. Next slide. Okay, so there's a lot of different ways that an insolvency can play out from an operational standpoint. Uh, the two you know, broad, the main fork in the road is, does the company continue trading, which is um, on the left, or does it wind up its operations and cease trading, which is the road on the right? And even when you're in a situation where you may continue trading, there's different ways, things that that can look like. It can be an informal insolvency arrangement where the company reaches an informal agreement with its creditors. There can be more formal arrangements in terms of how the company deals with its creditors, or there can be a, a formal administration, um, in which case an administrator will be appointed and be taking decisions. Um, so broadly speaking, um, there's different levels of formality, but on any of these situations, there's a possibility that a third party who's not as familiar with the company might be coming in to take decisions on behalf of the company. Next slide. Okay. Restructuring um, is an even broader term than insolvency. And if there's different ways that an insolvency can play out, restructuring is really a very broad and loose term for all sorts of different things that can happen to a company. Um, it can involve legal restructuring, which involves how the entities uh, are involved. It could be new entities, or you could be combining entities. There may be an ownership restructuring, in which case you may be bringing in new or different owners. Um, operational or business model restructuring um, can be um, where the company changes what it does or the, the business that it engages in, or financial restructuring, where the, the company's financial arrangements, such as its um, loans or financing, can be restructured, meaning you've got you know bankers um, or other financial financial professionals that need to come in and value the company um, for purposes of the financial restructuring. Next slide. Uh, so the common denominator throughout any of these arrangements, whether it's an insolvency or restructuring, um, is that basically you know that value is going to be key. The company needs to show the value in its operations for one reason or another. Money is tight. That's how we ended up here in the first place. And there could be new faces that are involved in terms of either making decisions on behalf of the company or in terms of valuing the company for purposes of either financing or some other arrangements. Next slide. So let's look at what happens now that we've thrown COVID-19 into the mix. We all know that this has caused unprecedented economic disruption, and there's lots of speculation in the media about um, increases in insolvency and restructuring. So the question that we we're, want we're to discuss is where does GDPR fit into all this? So if you look at the next slide, The ICO has already come out and stated um, their position in terms of, of um, how they're going to operate in the, in the world of COVID-19. This is a quote from the ICO and from the ICO's website. And what the ICO has said is that they will be quite sympathetic, empathetic, and pragmatic 
in terms of how they're dealing with enforcement of information rights. Um, so very, very um, specifically, the ICO has said that there will be some leeway in terms of timing. And, and the overall message is that they appreciate that businesses are under some real stress right now. And so when it comes to dealing with GDPR, they are obviously still enforcing it, but they're going to be a bit more sympathetic in terms of how they're going to be enforcing it. But if you look at the next slide, The ICO has also said that, you know, once we start coming out of the back of this, the ICO recognizes that GDPR is going to play a central role in promoting economic growth. I mean, GDPR is not just about fines and, and, and being a strain on the business. It is important to promote economic growth. And as we come out of this, it's going to be quite important that GDPR is supporting what's happening in, in the UK economy. So what does this mean? If we move to the next slide, this means that the GDPR, your GDPR house has to be in order. And what we're gonna talk about today is how can GDPR support value and reduce costs when you're dealing with insolvency and restructuring situations, because that's really what's most important when you're dealing with insolvency and restructuring, um, because money is tight and you need to be able to get maximum value out of what you have. So what this means in the next slide, you wanna maximize your asset value, you wanna minimize administrative fees and costs, you wanna use the familiarity that you already have with the business and your GDPR program to do that. You wanna maximize your restructuring opportunities um, and you wanna make sure that you can maintain business continuity in the middle of all of this. Next slide. But it is important to realize speed is going to be of the essence. When opportunities come up and when you do have these situations, you want to make the most of the opportunities quickly. Um, being prepared before the starting gun goes off is really important. And again, that's what we're going to be focusing on today. Um, you also want to be able to anticipate um, what might happen in order to be able to retain the ongoing business. Don't forget that in most of these situations, business will be ongoing. It's not that it's just going to cease trading altogether. More often than not, there is an ongoing business. So you need to think about how you can support that ongoing business um, as efficiently as possible. But in the back of your mind, bear in mind that there may be new or unfamiliar faces that are involved in the decisions or assessing the value of the business. So if we move on to the next topic, we're going to start talking, first of all, about the legal considerations that happens when somebody goes insolvent. Um, and so if you look at the next slide, it's going to depend on what the company that's insolvent is doing in terms of GDPR. So let's talk about what happens when a data controller is insolvent. First question is going to be who's taking the decisions. Now, as we said, there are going to be certain circumstances, not always, but certain circumstances where new faces and different faces are going to be taking business decisions. For example, an insolvency practitioner or an administrator. Um, now, again, as, we, as we're going to keep pointing out throughout all this, GDPR is still relatively new. And so the role of any administrator or insolvency practitioner under the GDPR is still unclear. They're going to be taking decisions on behalf of the business. The business is still going to be the data controller, but there is some, some um, thought that at some point, the administrator or insolv pra insolvency practitioner themselves may be assuming the role of the data controller. Um, again, this is not very clear. Um, what they would have to do in order to make them the controller as opposed to the business. Um, but in any circumstance, you do know that the business will need to continue to take decisions on GDPR actions. We do await guidance in terms of um, at what point does that data controllership either get shared with or move over to the administrator and solvency practitioner. Um, but basically, this is an ongoing issue that we're going to wait to see clarity on. But the data controller um, you know, is the one that's supposed to be taking decisions. Under what we know about GDPR, if we look at the next slide, you know, we do know that data controllers are primarily liable for their own compliance. This is Article 5. Uh, now, we know that this is what the GDPR says, but unfortunately, because the GDPR is still relatively new, we haven't seen this in action 
in terms of how regulators look at this. Um, so while you may take some comfort in Article 5, we, we still don't know in terms of enforcement actions how regulators or even ICO is, gonna, um, is going to deal with these points in terms of uh, any event of non-compliance. We do want to look at how can the insolvency of a data controller affect others from a GDPR standpoint, because the point here is that you can't take too much comfort in the fact that a data controller that's insolvent will be sort of an island unto themselves and that that liability or the insolvency won't have any legal effects on other companies that are involved with that data controller from a GDPR standpoint. So starting with Article 83, which we all know has to do with administrative fines, you know, Article 83 gives us, again, a bit of comfort on this point. It says that when a supervisory authority is dealing with the issue of an administrative fine, it should give due regard to the degree of responsibility of the controller or processor taking into account what they've already done. So again, this theoretically gives you some comfort that if a data controller is insolvent, that in terms of um, how, how a regulator would look at this for fining the, the, the data controller, they're gonna look at that data controller and their own degree of responsibility. Um, again, we haven't quite seen how this plays out um, in, in reality, but this is what Article 83 says. But before you take too much comfort in Article 83, and if we can go move to the next slide, it also says that amongst other things, a supervisory authority should take due regard of any action that taken by the controller or processor to mitigate. And again, you may be in a situation with an insolvent controller that the person taking the mitigation actions may not be the, the typical business um, stakeholder. It may be an insolvency practitioner or an administrator that does not have the same um, the same view about where to spend the money or where to put the where, where to put the effort at that point in time. So for example, we've seen some situations where responding to DSAR requests, subject access requests for somebody who's insolvent, the, the administrator, if there's one appointed, may not uh, may not take the same view in terms of the importance of responding to a data subject request while you're in the middle of an insolvency. So if you think about a controller to processor situation, that could or theoretically affect how a processor is viewed from an administrative standpoint. Um, and you know we just don't know how supervisory authorities are gonna approach this. We have seen that the ICO has said that they're gonna take a very pragmatic view in general, um, but until we can see how this plays out in reality, um, you can't take too much comfort in the fact or the thought that a data controller that goes insolvent um, won't have issues that will affect you if you're a data processor dealing with that data controller. Um, but let's let's move on past administrative fines. Let's look at what happens when you've got data subjects involved who they want compensation. So if we can move to the next slide. Article 82 makes it abundantly clear that things get very, oh, sorry, previous slide, we've moved on. So basically, this is the situation that under Article 82, we know we've got an issue. Article 82 makes it very clear that data subjects who have a claim for compensation can go after controllers and processors um, for the full amount of the damage. And where one of, of those entities has paid full compensation, um, the, that controller or processor needs to then claim back from the other culpable parties their due um, their sort of appropriate amount of that compensation. So basically, you can already see a situation where if you've got a controller processor, but the controller has gone insolvent, those that processor can be liable for full amount of damages to any data subjects who've suffered damage. The processor's only recourse is to go back against the, the data controller for the data controller share of the liability or, or compensation. But you can already see how that's gonna work. If you've got an insolvent data controller, the processor is not really gonna have much of an opportunity to, to actually see any recovery from that. And it's also important to note that if the comfort that you take from that as data processor is some sort of indemnity um, in a contract with a data controller, you can already see how that indemnity is not gonna be worth much if the data controller is actually insolvent. So essentially speaking, 
um, where a data controller is insolvent, the data processor that may be involved in that processing activity can be responsible for the full amount of damage to the data subjects, compensation of the data subjects, with very little practical recourse back against the data controller, notwithstanding what might be in your contract and notwithstanding uh, any indemnity that you've got. So this is a clear example of where that liability and those responsibilities start to be shared under the GDPR. Another clear example where this is gonna be the case is if you've got joint controllers. Um, we already know that joint controllers um, you know, have joint liability and Article 26 makes that clear. So again, another situation where if a data controller has gone insolvent, if you are a joint controller with that, with that entity, you need to think very clearly about what that liability is gonna to do to you. Um, next situation we want to talk about in the next slide. is what happens if it's the data processor who's insolvent? Well, we already know that data processors could have liability to regulators. We've just talked about that. But what makes it even more confusing or more um, or less certain in this context is that we do know that data controllers already have an overall responsibility for the processing. So if it's a data processor that's gone insolvent and you're the data controller, um, it is not going to be easy to just isolate out the, right, the liability that that data processor would otherwise have. If you're a data controller, you can expect that you need to think about what that does to you and your liabilities. Um, and again, same point on, on liability to consumers um, for, for compensation. We've already seen under Article 82 that you know you, they're tied at the hip. If the data processor goes insolvent, then the data controller can be responsible for the full amount of, of compensation and will have very little recourse back to the data processor who is insolvent. But if we move to the next slide, we don't want to forget the fact that in addition to legal liabilities in terms of fines and compensation, data processors also have um, operational obligations to data controllers. What happens to those when the data processor becomes insolvent? Well, we know that data processors have obligations to assist data controllers, so the data controllers to fulfill their responsibilities. For example, if we've got data subject requests or things like that. Article 28 requires data processors to provide this, this assistance to data controllers, but if your data processor is insolvent, you're a data controller, you still have obligations to the data subjects and you still have overall responsibility for the processing, but you might not be able to rely on that data processor to support you in, in fulfilling those responsibilities. Um, data controllers also, and this is kind of the most important point to bear in mind, data controllers have to provide services to data controllers. That's what they're there for. Things like maintaining security measures. Um, so it's hard, very hard to isolate out a data processor's liabilities um, when the data processor becomes insolvent. And you know, it, it's a lot for data controllers to think about in terms of what they do in order to um, maintain their responsibilities under the GDPR. So if we move to the next slide, the point that we want you to take away from here is that even if you've got one entity that's insolvent, that liability or responsibility can spread out beyond the insolvent company. Um, and, and we've just talked about different ways that that can be the case. Even if there's no actual spread of the liability, if you're involved from a GDPR standpoint with a company that goes insolvent, everyone has to think about your cost to defend or respond to claims. Um, so there may be no way around, uh, you know, it costs like attorneys um, or things like that. Now, we don't know what this is actually going to look like because again, the GDPR is still very new um, and we still need to see how it plays into these situations that are going to be quite, quite, we think common going forward. Um, so what we're going to talk about in the next two sections are the practical considerations, either if your company is the one that's in the situation of being insolvent or restructuring, or if you're dealing with a company. So Hannah, off to you. Thank you, Judy. So I will now look at the practical considerations for companies that are going into insolvency or restructuring. But of course, do bear in mind that if you're thinking of acquiring a company yourself, just consider these in reverse, um, as these will be the kind of things that you're looking for and asking for in a target company. So we've talked about data value, and, and this involves looking after your data um, and ensuring you're meeting your data protection requirements under the GDPR. 
but now it's May 2020. It's been two years since the GDPR came into force and you will be expected to have your house in order with respect to GDPR compliance. Hopefully the GDPR is not an entirely new concept to you um, and your organisation has considered uh, how you are complying with the regulation already. But have you considered what areas of compliance may be key in the event of a restructuring or insolvency? And this is where we're asking, do you know where your GDPR documentation is? So contracts. Regardless of the, your business, you will have numerous contracts with third parties. So from our involvement in helping companies recontract on new terms following the implementation of the GDPR, we understand that sometimes in the panic of the end stage of negotiation and trying to close the deal, that a final version of a contract can end up safe somewhere, which may not be the most appropriate place. And therefore, finding an original contract a year or more down the line can be a bit of a minefield. But you do need to know where all these contracts are, that the contracts are up to date and that they're organised in some way. Ideally, your contract should all be in one place or at least easily accessible to those who should have access. So it's important to use the time now to start thinking how your contracts can be better organised. Find the ones that you think are missing or may have been saved in a different place in the rush to get a deal through. Also, ensure you have up-to-date contact information for key contacts with whom you contract with. Next slide. Next is your Article 30 records. So under the GDPR, organisations are expected to maintain records of their processing activities, and you need to make sure that these are up to date and consider whether any new types of processing needs to be added. These will need to be accurate. We often see that companies have created these back in 2018 when the GDPR came into force, but they're not regularly reviewed and updated. So when we go to look at them years later, they're not quite up to date. So complete Article 30 records help to understand all the processing taking place within the business, and they help to confirm your company's data protection compliance. When we've worked on an M&A deal for a client previously, these documents were requested and they did cause issues when the company in question did not have complete Article 30 records. Also consider your data protection registrations. These two should be up to date. So in terms of consents, here we're predominantly referring to marketing. Marketing contacts are often extremely valuable data, but only if you've been if you've collected them in a compliant way. So it's a good idea to consider what your database currently looks like. Where required, do you have the necessary consents to market to the individuals within your marketing list? And can you demonstrate that you have evidence of that consent? Where consent is required and you cannot demonstrate that those individuals have consented or where it is not and you cannot demonstrate the basis on which you market to those individuals, the value of that data is affected. At best, you have a marketing list which doesn't have the necessary evidence to demonstrate its compliance with the GDPR and the privacy laws. And unfortunately, at worst, you have a marketing list which not only has no evidence to demonstrate consent, but potentially didn't even have the correct consent obtained originally. So it's more likely to receive complaints from the individual recipients and also attract regulatory attention. With respect to marketing lists, it's also important to consider any restrictions around the use of the data for marketing. Consider, is the consent transferable? What can be marketed based on that consent? Or will a new buyer have to obtain fresh consent from the individuals for what they're intending to do? Next slide. So whilst no one necessarily anticipates this position, does your privacy notice cover the potential for data sharing in these circumstances? We often see this with respect to mergers or acquisitions, but has your company considered restructuring or insolvency? You may want to consider what is currently included in your privacy notice and take a look at this when you next carry out a review of your notice. Next slide, please. So data transfer mechanisms. 
As you may be aware, under the GDPR, any transfer of personal data outside the EEA to a country not deemed as providing adequate protection for personal data by the EU Commission requires entry into an appropriate data transfer mechanism in order to protect that personal data wherever it may travel across the world. Many companies with global entities and global suppliers will have arrangements in place to cover the transfers here. For global companies, this will often be covered in an intra-group agreement with the use of standard contractual clauses, but any transfer outside the EEA to a country not deemed as adequate must have in place standard contractual clauses, privacy shield or binding corporate rules being the most common examples. For a global business, there is a huge value in being able to lawfully transfer data across the world, and therefore it's important that these mechanisms are up to date. So what do we mean by this? There are a number of different reasons why your mechanisms may not be up to date. As explained, many global companies will have in place an intra-group data transfer agreement, which includes the standard contractual clauses, and this allows data to be transferred between your group companies. Whilst these agreements are a great way to document these arrangements, unfortunately, sometimes when new companies join or are acquired, they don't get added to the agreement and therefore have not technically signed up to the appropriate transfer mechanism, which enables the lawful transfer of personal data. We recommend that you ensure that this is up to date. Any transfers occurring to group companies who are not signed up to the agreement and therefore not signed up to the transfer mechanism will mean data is not being transferred lawfully, and this does pose a risk. Following on from this, having a mechanism for adding and departing companies is important too. If a company is no longer part of a group, there must be a way in which an organisation can ensure that they are appropriately added or removed from the agreement. You do not want to have an agreement which lists entities who are no longer part of your group companies and therefore not entitled to receive data under the agreement. And finally, Brexit. So the word which is such a key phrase for the last four years has found itself a little lost in the current situation, but it is still happening. And at present, the transition period is set to end in December of this year. This means that after December 2020, the UK will no longer be a part of the EU and this may well affect the transfer mechanisms that you as an organisation currently have in place. The current position is that after December, transfers of personal data from the UK to the EU will remain as is and there will be no change here and no requirement to enter into a transfer mechanism. However, transfers from the EU to the UK will require a transfer mechanism. So if you're a company operating globally that transfers data from the EU to the UK, you may need to update your current transfer arrangements to ensure that they can continue with your current, you can continue with your current data sharing arrangements after December 2020. With Brexit on the horizon, it will be expected that companies have considered Brexit and have measures in place to handle how transfers will take place lawfully after the end of this year. So, data subject rights process. Firstly, you should have a data subject rights process in place. Not only is this important for your GDPR compliance, but it will also assist in the event that an insolvency practitioner or someone else within the business needs to pick this up and follow it in the event of receipt of a data subject access request. Keeping this information in an accessible place and having a central point of contact for logging and handling the request will ensure that these are managed appropriately during any transition or uncertain period. Next slide, please. Leading on from data subject rights policies, all your documentation, like your contracts, should be in a central depository of all your policies. It should also be clear what the latest versions are so these can easily be found and followed. Other key de documentation which should also be kept is things like a data breach log, correspondence with regulators or complaints that you have received and handled. These should be accessible in one place. This again not only helps to demonstrate your compliance with the GDPR with respect to any buyer, but also having in place this information available will assist an insolvency practitioner, if that is the case, in managing anything which may come into the business 
during this time. So, what does getting your GDPR house in order really mean? In short, you do want and need to be organised. You need to be able to easily access and provide up-to-date key documentation, which not only evidences compliance with the GDPR, but demonstrates the value of your company's data and your assets. Hazel will now talk us through our final point for today. Thanks so much, Hannah. That's a very clear list of, of all the practical things that can be done right now. So I'm going to finish off with a discussion of the practical topics when dealing with a company that is insolvent or restructuring. So the points that Hannah made and Judy made earlier on will be very relevant here. So first of all, you need to think about what is your relationship with this insolvent or restructured company, this data partner? Is it a controller to controller or controller to processor relationship? And therefore, where can you be responsible for the insolvent company's actions? There could be many situations as Judy highlighted earlier on. Next, I think you need to look at who is actually performing this contract and who will perform this contract. So first of all, I think it might be wise to have a retrospective look at asking for sufficient guarantees. So if you look back at your present data partner, uh, did you ask for sufficient guarantees? Have you documented that? Does that help you now? Or is that potentially a risk factor because it wasn't done thoroughly enough? We have provisions in GDPR which talk about asking for sufficient guarantees. So you have um, legislative background to ask for this information. You also have background, I think, which justifies the ability to carry out audits, whether it's potentially annual or biannual audits to check on the provider who you've been working with. But let's assume that provider is actually insolvent or restructuring, and therefore you need to look at an alternative supplier. Again, you need to look at what are the sufficient guarantees you're going to get from that alternative. You don't want just any old person handling your data or providing services. You want to carry out appropriate due diligence, so you need that vendor questionnaire or other documented due diligence so that if the contract is transferred, you have a solid replacement. And the points that Hannah made will be very relevant here. The next point, I think, is a bit of a flashback for me. This was particularly pre prevalent when cloud computing was all new and fresh. The idea that data accessibility and portability would be key, and there were many concerns about with clients that, that perhaps they would be locked into a particular provider. So with an insolvent provider or part data partner, this takes on a new relevance. You need to make sure that you have the contractual rights to get your data back and practically that it will work, that you will be able to transfer it, that you can move it, that the format works. And if that doesn't work, um, can you use your own backups or archives? Maybe that's an, a possibility. And do you need any particular per permissions to get access? So these are all things that will need to be checked so that you have a continuing viable business able to use its data. So let's now recap on the four topics that we've looked at today. Judy took us through where GDPR fits into insolvency, restructuring and value and some of the legal considerations when a company is insolvent, the finger pointing who will be responsible for what. Anna took us through the practical considerations for companies that are going into insolvency or restructuring, which also is relevant if you are looking to target or buy one of those types of companies. And then I briefly looked at the points that we think are relevant for dealing with companies that happen to be your data partners who are also insolvent or restructuring. So in conclusion, we think that there are a number of points that you can do that you can work on right now to enhance the value and protect your business in the event of an insolvency or restructuring, whether that's yours or someone else. So we'd like to thank you for your attention so far. And now let's see whether we have some questions from you that we can pick up right now. Uh, I think at the moment we are just waiting. So please do pop your questions in the 
question box if you would like to. And whilst you're doing that, I shall use the opportunity to ask some questions of my own uh, since it's here and they cannot refuse to answer them. So I'm going to turn first of all to Judy. Um, Judy, we're, we're lawyers. We love talking about doom and gloom. So we're going to indulge that for a moment and think about what I'd like is your view on where you think the first disputes or maybe even the first case law will come in this area. And do you know why that might be? Or can you guess why that might be? Um, thanks for that, Hazel. Um, and you're right, I can't refuse to answer since you are my <laughs> boss. Um, <laughs> you know, I, as we were looking through the, the how do the liabilities and responsibilities, how are they connected um, and not isolated? I think it's pretty clear that it's the controller to processor situation, both legally and operationally, that are the most rife for conflict. Um, because you can't separate out the liability and the responsibility. The data controller is always going to have that overall responsibility if a, if a data processor um, has some problems, either formal insolvency or just restructuring, um, but also operationally. And I think that's really where the key is. Um, as you're looking at companies that are trying to emerge from whatever situations that they're in, where you have a data processor um, that it has problems, um, it's just unavoidable that those problems are going to affect the data controller. The data controllers may have to think about stepping up and taking on more responsibility, or as you've pointed out, Hazel, the data controller may have to think about alternative providers, but then that's where Hannah's points about the data processor wanting to be able to show that they are still responsible. They do still have their house in order. Um, they do want to maintain that business. That's all an area that I think is clearly right for, for um, conflict, whether those are mm -hmm. lawsuits or otherwise. I also want to just say, you you know, and this was the point I was um, sort of alluding to, where you've got cyber breaches, um, because we all know that COVID is is um, not not um, discriminatory, uh, and will we're seeing a lot of cyber breaches and cyber breach responsibility. Um, we do not know how the regulators, even the ICO, who's taking a very pragmatic approach, views that that responsibility of a controller and a processor where we've got a data breach. Um, and we can look at what I'll call the tale of two airlines. You know, we're all waiting to see what happens with the British Airways breach. And we know with British Airways, we've got a controller and processor who are both in the frame for a cyber breach and, and some consumer harm. Uh, we don't know what the ICO is going to do on that. We do suspect that the ICO is going to take a pragmatic approach. We've got an airline, British Airways, that is sort of um, fighting for its survival right now. Now, compare that to EasyJet. Uh, you know, we've got another airline that is clearly struggling, but yet this week, uh, I think, is uh, we've got the news that not only did they have a data breach, but they've already been sued for a reported one billion pounds. Now, nothing's going to stop. Um, you know, plaintiffs, claimants, lawyers from trying, uh, trying it on when you've got these situations. But it comes back to the point that in that controller processor um, scenario, particularly where you do want to continue doing business, you do want to get as much value out of out of your operations as you can. Um, that's the area where I think we're going to see the most, um, you know, most action um, as GDPR lawyers and in terms of of liabilities and in terms of lawsuits. Okay. Thank you. Um, so we have two or three questions coming in now, but I'm, I'm still going to use Chairman's prerogative and, and pose my question to Hannah first, and then we're going to turn to the questions from the audience. So Hannah, um, uh, you spoke about a number of steps, all of which looked eminently sensible to me. But at this moment in time, businesses are going to find that budgets, budgets are tight, and so is time. So could you perhaps, I don't know, highlight one or two or three steps that you think are frequently missing and essential or key or give the most or the biggest improvement in a company's position? Uh, what's your view on that? How can you summarize that for, for clients? Yeah, sure. So I think getting your internal documentation in order, like your contracts and your Article 30 records, in my view, is a bit of a quick win. Um, they can be handled internally, um, 
by the organization and it will require time more than more than cost mm -hmm. uh, sure. but in terms of data value if you are a business that has a substantial marketing list or or relies heavily on marketing um, within your uh, for your organization then this is where the value is held so making sure you have valid consents um, in line with e-privacy and gdpr requirements with respect to your marketing list will stand you in good stead thank you thanks so um we do have a few questions and i think now we can turn to answering um at least some of these questions if not all of them if, if we don't get to all of your questions we will email answers to you after the session finishes so the first question um, comes from Jenna and it's, uh, I'll read it out. What are your top tips for new contracts with data processors to protect your company as a data controller in the event of a processor's insolvency? Um, and I'm, I'm gonna jump in with a few comments first of all, and then perhaps ask Judy and Hannah to, to chip in as well. Uh, for me, I think, um, you said you talk there about top tips for a new new contracts i think it might be extra contractual if i can put it that way i think what is important is the the due diligence that is carried out and with the best will in the world i think uh, we're all appreciating that now that perhaps previously privacy due diligence wasn't as high up the food chain as it should have been so rigorous due diligence on data processes I think um, is good, is needed, and also, uh, and this does feed into the contract, the ability to repeat that on a regular basis. So if you have a five-year contract with someone, you don't just do the due diligence at the outset, you repeat that, perhaps not every year, maybe every year if it's an important uh, contractual partner, but certainly at least every couple of years. So that would be my top tip. Um, Judy, would you, want to add anything? What do you think should go into the contract to protect a controller in that situation? Yeah, I, Hazel, I agree with your points. And I think the point is that better selection and documentation of your due diligence on the vendor and how you're going to get the, the, the processor and how you're going to get the sufficient guarantees is going to be worth far more in the end than what's in the contract. And my, my point on that is, and, and we see it all the time, people spend a lot of time and effort uh, in negotiating indemnities. Uh, and, and at the end of the day, I mean, this is the point, which is, you know, don't put your time into negotiating an indemnity that at the end of the day may or may not have any value. Put your, mm -hmm. your efforts into choosing the right vendor, making sure that you are, have the ability to follow up with that vendor at key points in time to do things like ensure that you can you can make sure that they're still taking uh, appropriate security measures. Uh, you know, key, key point obviously coming back to the cyber breach point. Um, but think about the the business relationship and the operational aspects more than what's in the contract. Um, because at the end of the day, the contract terms are, are going to give you um, limited limited ability to sleep at night. And then make sure that also you have the ability that if you do have reasonable concerns about what's going on, that you can pull the plug um, and move to an alternative provider and not be stuck into a contract that has you paying for services that you don't feel comfortable or, or that you don't feel like you should have to um, to, to worry about. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Hannah, anything that you would add in terms of how to contractually protect a data controller? No, I think I agree with your points and I think you're right, Hazel. I think being able to regularly review um, your processes um, throughout a long-term contract. Um, often you see contracts are kind of just renewed or regularly um, and not necessarily re revisited um, because yeah. perhaps it's a, it's a long-term relationship. I think using that time to review will be, will be valuable. Sure, thank you. Okay, let's um, move on to the next one. So we have a, a comment and a question um, from uh, Lucy, which is, um, uh, let me just make sure I've got this right. I, I have had processors in insolvency, but I have found that insolvency practitioners have low level of knowledge of data protection law. Concerns around backup tapes that might not have been wiped and then sold as assets. How do we get insolvency practitioners that understand these issues? 
and again, um, if you don't mind, ladies, I'm going to jump in with some comments first of all, and then perhaps turn to, in this case, Judy uh, for for some comments. Um, I'm, I'm not sure that this will be a huge uh, help to you, but I do think it might be a question of time. I have worked, um, yeah, I've I've been advising on data protection since the 1990s, and probably it's only in the last five or so years that I've actually uh, advised insolvency practitioners on data protection law. And clearly, they have been handling personal data for decades. So I think it is over time we are seeing insolvency practitioners grasping that here is another area of compliance that they have to juggle with in what is you know, undoubtedly a very difficult situation. And we've seen guidance that has come out in the last year or so from the Insolvency Practitioners Association. So I think it is changing. I think it will change. Um, I think that there's very little case law in this area. And so that probably doesn't help us in that insolvency practitioners will be focusing on you know, the things that will make the biggest impact to the value of the contract, uh, sorry, the company and um, also their own personal liability. So perhaps data protection hasn't yet uh, re been risen to that level that they take a huge amount of notice. But I do think that Judy's point about data value being key is going to be very important. So I think it's incremental. I think the um, insolvency practitioner world is coming alive to data protection as an issue. And the Insolvency Practitioners Association has issued guidance on this. I think incrementally we will see case law, but probably more importantly, I think we will see insolvency practitioners starting to look at the data in the companies having a value and therefore needing to preserve that data uh, so that they preserve that value. Judy, is there anything that you would like to add to that, that question? Yeah, Lucy, thanks Thanks for the question, because this was sort of top of mind as we were putting this program together. Um, you know, so I think Hazel's, the point that Hazel, I'm going to underscore that she made, which is that I think that as insolvency practitioners, if they view GDPR as, oh, we want to avoid fines, um, and they're not going to prioritize it the way that, that they should for all the reasons that we're talking about in terms of value. If they see it as an enabler of value or assisting value, um, then obviously it gets more attention. Um, but the point of this program and what we tried to put together were helpful tips for people that are already dealing with GDPR issues. So, you know, in your case, your data processors that are insolvent, presumably somebody at that data processor has handled that GDPR program. And, and the overall message here is that, you know, you want the people that have put that program together to be able to educate and upskill those insolvency practitioners quite quickly. You know, a lot of people put GDPR in the too difficult bu bucket. It is a difficult and complicated law that requires a lot of documentation. Um, and it's very easy to get lost in the detail and, and get, you know, forget that you need to sort of help people like these insolvency practitioners see the wood for the trees. And, you know, the common point throughout this, this webinar is to help people that do understand the GDPR program and have put it together, how can they be able to have the tools at their disposal to engage with those insolvency practitioners and to be able to very quickly and without taking a lot of um, effort, be able to upskill those insolvency practitioners to what are the high level points and feed into that insolvency practitioner's agenda, which is going to be extracting the most value while spending the least amount of money getting there. Yeah, I think that's a good summary. That is a very good summary, Judy. And in fact, the, the, the case that I worked on most recently was, um, was actually uh, where the insolvency practitioner came to me for advice because they desperately needed to export personal data in order to run some litigation in another jurisdiction. So they were definitely focusing not on, I would say, compliance as such. What they were focusing on was, how do I get money into this insolvent company so that I can pay off some of the debts? I'm going to have to run this litigation. So it's, in, it's vital that I do this and I do this in a way that is lawful. So I, I think that was definitely the way to um, to sort of make the impression on the insolvency practitioner was focusing on the value in the company and how to maximize that. 
Okay. So we have one more question. I think we've probably got time to have a, a discussion about this. This is a question from John. So he says, uh, thanks for a very thought provoking webinar. How practically can a controller acquiring an insolvent controller repaper consents for marketing that are questionable? e.g. due to a lack of sufficient evidence or due to a consent wording which met the original marketing need but not a future need post acquisition. Are these salvageable? Should they just be written off? And I think um, I'll probably ask Hannah um, if she would like to comment on this but as per normal I'll, I'll make sure that I say something first so so Hannah you can um, you can tidy up after me after I've said the wrong thing. So I think, uh, John, I regret to say there's a, there's a real lawyer's answer to this, isn't there? Uh, it depends. And I think you, you appreciate this in the way that you have uh, framed your question. I think it will depend exactly on how questionable these consents are um, and whether it is a lack of evidence and perhaps your business or the new business, the acquiring business is prepared to live with that and wait a moment for a moment in the future when there is a convenient time to go out to the people on the list and refresh the consents and thereby start to collect the sufficient evidence that's needed. And a similar thing applies, I think, to whether the consent is broad enough for the future needs, whether you are prepared to carry some risk in the meantime because of the cost of going out to refresh and the risk that if you go out to refresh you might lose a load of consent um, and perhaps have some trigger some way of communicating to with people on the list to get their their refreshed and broadened consent for future needs so uh, that's what i would say is it, it's not clear cut you can't say whether actually you just need to scrap the whole lists and start again, or you can just carry on in a blase fashion and just use them for whatever you want. There is, There will be a risk uh, to continuing and there will be a risk to refreshing and getting the evidence because you might lose people and the business needs to decide how much risk it's prepared to carry. And that might be aligned to how the communications are going out. If the communications are going out by email, maybe there's less risk than if there's some sort of um, text or other sort of uh, slightly more intrusive way of contacting the individuals. So Hannah, I've just uh, chatted on there, but perhaps you can tidy up for me and summarise what you think in answer to John's question. Yes, thank you, Hazel. Uh, and I agree. I think there isn't a clear cut answer. It is a risk based approach. It also may well depend on um well it depend on your risk appetite but also you know what type of marketing it is is, is it is a b2b marketing list um you know so are you, are you marketing to businesses or is it b2c and, and you're marketing to consumers because there are different risks um depending as well on on who you're marketing to um around around the laws for e, e privacy and marketing and in line with that what countries as well as is, is this marketing taking place mm -hmm, in true. different countries have different positions in terms of the e-privacy um, position um, and the ability to market to consumers and businesses. Very true, very true. Okay, so I'm just looking at the time now and I, th I think we probably need to draw this to a close. We have a couple of questions that we haven't quite got to, but um, I'm conscious that I need to get you all back to your your virtual desks and your emails and your IMs um, by 11. So please rest assured we will reply to the outstanding questions by email so that you, you have an answer on those. So I'm going to draw this to a close now and say thank you very much for joining. I hope you found it helpful and interesting. We certainly found your questions very helpful and interesting and thought provoking so we enjoyed that. If you have any particular topics you'd like us to cover in the future please do let us know. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, you will be sent a copy of the slides, you'll be sent a recording so you can catch up on this. If you have missed any of our webinars, you can see them on the Field Fisher YouTube channel, you can see on the final slide we've put a link to that. Uh, you will also find on the YouTube channel our Get DP Fit series, which is a series of sort of back to basics, shorter um, sessions of up to 30 minutes introducing different DP topics.
So I think all it uh, remains for me to do is to thank you very much for your attention and uh, hope to speak with you on another webinar soon and have a great rest of the day.